Uh, before before we get going with the with the, the details of the halachas, just that you should know that the whole function behind lighting the candles on Hanukkah is a concept which is called pirsume nissa. Pirsume nissa is Aramaic for publicizing the miracle, right? Which is again in in Hebrew that would be pirsum nais or pirsume nais to to publicize the miracle. So the whole function of lighting the Hanukkah candles is to publicize the miracle that took place and that the battle and the rededication of the temple and everything that went together with it. And as we'll see in Mitzvah Hashem, that's one of the reasons why part of the, uh, part of the mitzvahs is where you're supposed to light the candles. You should light them in a prominent place where they can be seen. Uh, we'll see in Mitzvah Hashem as we get going. The miracle of the rededication of the temple and the light lasting for ten days. We're not. We're not. We're not uh, publicizing the the war. We're not publicizing no, 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 the no, end I of the war. That, but we're just publicizing the yeah the, the miraculous. I, mean, I I think one of the reasons is possibly like this. As I mentioned yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, Hanukkah is a rabbinical festival. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, what was what was called a minor uh, when I was growing up a minor festival, and uh, <clears throat> the the uh, maybe maybe the idea over here is that the. Uh, a lot, a lot of, a lot of effort is being put into making this, you know, turning it into something that's got a lot of, a lot of publicity to it, in order to give it an importance that maybe it wouldn't have otherwise. We have to know that when the rabbis introduce, you know, rabbinic laws and rabbinic uh, festivals and things like that, we have to take them very seriously. Okay, let's go back. When, when, when Hanukkah, the original Hanukkah, right? Mm -hmm. When did they start celebrating it? In the, in the year after, the original dedication took place, right? So maybe, maybe I'm just. This is like conjecture, but yeah. maybe, maybe all of this grew up out of having to teach the Jews in Israel yeah. that the miracle had taken place and that they need to recognize that God's around. Again, there was an awful lot of Hellenization that was going on, right. <clears throat> and um, maybe, maybe, maybe that's part. I'm I need to, to try to look this up a little bit. Maybe, may, but maybe that's part of the uh, of the reason why it's given such prominence. Is that everyone should know, right here? This is what this is what happened last year, and this is what happened the year before, and the year before that. And you, you know, that the families need to know, and there needs to be it needs to be seen, right? A person needs to be seen to be publicizing that miracle. Maybe it's not just for the people who are wandering around outside, but also for the people inside to know that this is what they have to do. Okay, let, let's just get through the, the let's get through the the, uh, the the not nice part of the halachas of Hanukkah. Um, <laughs> Uh, all work is permitted on Hanukkah, but there is a custom that women refrain from working for the initial half an hour that the lights are lit for. In Mitz Hashem, we'll learn the halachas later on. We'll see how long the lights got to be a light for, but there's a minimum of half an hour from darkness onwards, from nightfall onwards. So let's say it gets dark <clears throat> at, uh, let's say it gets dark at, I don't know, when's it getting dark? At 5.15. So until quarter to six, the light should stay alight. Um, and uh, the, the custom is that the women don't do any work within that half an hour because the miracle of Hanukkah, one of the, one of the, one of the dimensions of the miracle of Hanukkah, what came about through a woman called Yehudit who managed to, uh, managed to, to uh, assassinate one of the, one of the uh, generals. And the, the, one, managed to assassinate one of the generals, and that, that was actually one of the turning points of the war. And therefore, because the women were so actively involved in the, in the miracle to begin with, so they've taken upon themselves a little bit of a more stringent approach, which is at least for the ob ob obligatory half an hour that they shouldn't do any work. The good news is that the Mishnah Brewer writes that there are certain communities where uh, the men have taken on that custom as well. So you shouldn't imagine that you're going to have to be working like a dog you know, for half an hour after the lights have been lit, right? Because, you know, your wife is going to be sitting there, uh, whatever, you know, eat, eating chocolates and, and uh, whatever, I don't know, whatever women do, you know, uh, breaking open a six pack, a six pack of beer or something and, uh, right, and, and telling you, here, you know, clean that and wash that and, and that needs to be ironed and that needs to be sewn back and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. You could just say, well, you know, according to the Mishnah Brewer, there are some communities where the men don't work as well and I've taken that upon myself. Blinader, of course, unless it's something that you particularly want to do. Um, the whole idea, of course, is to give us the, uh, the opportunity just to reflect upon the nature of the miracle, right? Which means that when you're not doing anything, when you're not involved in work and you're not involved in running around all over the place, so it just gives you the opportunity to sit down the, amongst the Hasidic 
Rebbe's, this is like a big thing. They sit in front of the menorah, they watch the flames, <clears throat> right? And they have all kinds of, you know, all kinds of insights into the concept of Hanukkah and the light that's being brought into the world. There is a, a very beautiful idea found in the, uh, in the Sfat Emet. The Sfat Emet is one of the great Hasidic Rebbe's. He's the second Rebbe from Gore, who writes like this. <clears throat> how many, how many, uh, how many Hanukkah lights are lit over the whole of Hanukkah? Oh, like well, following. 8 plus 7 plus 6 plus 5 plus 4 oh, plus yeah. 3 plus 2 plus yeah. 1. Says the Svasem, it's the most beautiful idea. He says that Adam was brought into the Garden of Eden. He was created on the 12th hour, the midday on Friday afternoon. And he was sent out of the Garden of Eden. God kept him in the Garden of Eden over Shabbat, even though he sinned already before Shabbat. And he was sent out at 12 o'clock at midnight on Saturday night. Which means, says the Sfas Emes, the, uh, the Adam Arishon, the first man, was privy to the light of the Garden of Eden for 36 hours. He stayed Shabbat then? He was allowed to stay in there for Shabbat. And then after Shabbat, he was expelled from the Garden of Eden. Uh, says the Sfas Emes, it's really a very beautiful idea. There was a very special light, an intensely spiritual light, that was in the Garden of Eden, something which was put away afterwards. The rabbis explain it was, it was stored away in God's, in God's uh, storage rooms, right? And the Svasema says that for 36 hours, Adam was privy to that light. And the lights of Hanukkah, which add up to 36, not including the Shamash, which we'll talk about later on, but the lights of Hanukkah, which add up to 36, are able to bring that light back into the world. Right? The light, the light fl fire in general is something which has got a very spiritual dimension to it, according to Jewish ideas, right? You know, fire is, is something, it's very ethereal fire. Um, you know, you can't, ta you can't, you can't hold it. You c if you touch it, it hurts, right? But you know, you can stick your finger through, I'm sure you all did that, right? M maybe as children, maybe last night, but, but you know, <clears throat> you know, just put your finger through the flame backwards and forwards, nothing happens. It's very, it's very, it's, it's like a, got a very esoteric dimension to it. And fire is always the idea of bringing light into the world, bringing warmth into the world. And fire is very analogous to the Torah itself. Right? That uh, the Torah is also, you know, com it's compared to fire, something that brings light, it brings tremendous warmth um, and allows us to do all kinds of things. That light is something which is very spiritual. Says the Sfasem, it's the 36 lights of Hanukkah, those 36 candles of Hanukkah, are there in order to help us bring that light back into the world again. And if you stop and think about it for a moment, it makes perfect sense, because yesterday we spoke about the idea that Hanukkah was uh, the time that the Jewish people went to war in order to be able to learn Torah, in order to bring, be able to bring the Torah back into their lives, and therefore the, the, uh, the uh, reward that's given to us is to light the Hanukkah lights. That's the, you know, like a, a, a measure for measure, right? We, we wanted to learn that Torah. We bring the light back into the world. And that's why by many people you'll see that over Hanukkah, when the lights are alight, they sit and they, they, they really, they still go into great introspection and uh, they, they meditate in front of those lights because the lights have got a quality to them which other lights don't have, right? Very special quality to them. Um, it's interesting that the, the sages point out that there's an intrinsic difference between the two, the two rabbinic fest festivals that we've got. I've got, I've got to stop calling them minor festivals, right? The, the two rabbinic <laughs> festivals, there's Hanukkah and there's Purim. Uh, Hanukkah is an intensely spiritual dimension and Purim is an intensely physical dimension, right? In Purim, what do we do? We, uh, I mean, it's true that there's a, the mitzvah of reading the Megillah, but, you know, we, we have an enormous pseudo, we have an enormous, enormous meal, we drink too much, and uh, sometimes people get a little bit drunk. And, uh, you know, it's, it's like it's a very physical time, and the sages explain that what we're doing is we're commemorating the two different dimensions. On Hanukkah, we were facing spiritual annihilation, which is why Hanukkah has that spiritual dimension to it of lighting candles and everything being on a spiritual plane. There is, like I mentioned yesterday, there is no mitzvah per se to have a suda, to have a meal, festive meal on Hanukkah. Right? The, the mitzvah of Hanukkah is to light the Hanukkah lights, whereas on Purim we faced physical annihilation, and therefore the way that we commemorate that is very much through the physical. 
So we'll have the Suda and we'll drink too much and we'll give out presents to people and we'll make sure that lots of charity is being given out. Like I mentioned before, it's true, we read the Megillah, but that's just one, one mitzvah out of many that we, uh, that we celebrate. Um, there's a, a, a very interesting book called Tame Hamin Hagim. In Tame Hamin Hagim, Tame, the, again, the, the, the name of the book indicates what it is. A ta'am means a taste. Ta'ame Hamin Hagim means a taste of the customs. And he explains the different customs that exist inside of the Jewish people. Explains why they are and where they come from. And in Tame Hamin Hagim, he's even got the most incredible explanation to, to the different things that are used on Hanukkah that are used on Purim. So, for example, on Hanukkah, I hope everybody here, you're familiar with the idea of using a dreidel. You know what a dreidel is? Mm -hmm. like a, little, a little, you know, spinning top, mm -hmm. and it's got different letters printed on it, and you can, you know, people used to, people still use that today, and they, uh, mm -hmm. and they, you, know, you can use, I know my kids use chocolate money. If you want, you can use real money. Um, if you're in education like I am, chocolate money is about all you're going um, <clears throat> to have. So, but if you, you know, if you get a proper job, <laughs> then uh, maybe you'll get paid for what you do, and uh, that way you can use real money. Um, but the dreidel has a dreidel look. It's got it's like a it's got a base, and then it's got the, the you know the little the little handle coming out the top like in order to be able to spin it. Huh? Different four different letters, four different sides, right and nays uh, nays right? gadol haya po, right? Which is nays is nun, gimel is gadol, hey haya, and pay po. Outside of Israel, they have dreidels which say sham instead of po, which means over there. So neis gadol sham, right? And uh, again, if you're, if you're using these things in order, to, in order to bet with, so you need, my kids need to be in here to explain what, what is what. The nun, if it falls on the nun, it means, I think nothing. that's nothing, yeah. right? Nun for nothing, it's right? English version. <laughs> no, I think it's the same by my kids as well, actually. I, for whatever reason, whatever, whatever mine, for whatever it is, I have to, whatever I've got, I've got to give it in. Even if it's different from the time before. I don't, I don't know how my kids work this one out. I really don't. Shove, oh, you... you shove it in. <coughs> shove it. <laughs> right, nothing, shove. <laughs> What's that, Hazaresco? Hey, you put one in, I think. And Gimel, Gadol, is you get, you get it all. Yeah. Get, you get it yeah. all, whatever's yeah. in there. Uh, all I know is that whatever I get, even if I get a Gimel, my kids say, no, no, you, you've got to put some in. <laughs> like, wait, wait a minute. Hold on, didn't you just tell me that by pay? No, no, no. Hey, we know the rules. <laughs> ah, okay. You know, um, it's a great being a parent. What can I tell you? Says the Tam Amin Agin, the most incredible idea. Listen to this. <clears throat> he says, everything we do, there's a meaning behind everything. Right? So the dreidel's got a handle which sticks up, and the noisemaker has a, a handle which sticks down. Right? You hold it over here, and the thing's on the top, and you, you go like that, right? So he says, what was the chat? He says, because on, on uh, Hanukkah, the dreidel, everything was spiritual, right? So the pointing up, the handle points up towards God, right? Everything, every, all of this is all spiritual. The whole thing of Hanukkah, the whole idea of what's going on. Whereas on Purim, everything is physical. The handle's pointing downwards, right? Down towards the physical earth, right? And it's interesting, actually, that if you take a look in the story of, uh, in the story of Purim, when we get closer to Purim, we can, you know, we can go through it. But when you get to the, when you get to uh, the story of Purim, you'll see it's very difficult to see. God doesn't even appear in the Megillah, the name of God. It's not there at all. And the whole idea is that God's very much hidden away somewhere over there. He's, he's like, you know, hidden in the background, and you've got to look for him. It's all very physical. And says the time I mean, I think it's an incredible idea that everything, everything, <coughs> everything in in uh, in. Um, Judaism has got meaning, everything has got symbolism and significance. Because Hanukkah is a rabbinical festival, there's no extra day added on. Right? So you know that when you're outside of Israel, if, you're, if it comes to a festival, normally we add an extra day. So for example, on Sukkot, oh, right. <clears throat> the end of Sukkot ends a day later in Chutzlar, it's outside of Israel, than it does over here. The end, of, the end of, what I just say, Sukkot, so the end of Pesach, Shavuot has got two days as well. Here in Israel, it's only one day, right? Uh, however, Hanukkah is eight days universally. It doesn't matter where you are. And the reason for that is <clears throat> that no decree is being decreed upon a decree. You can't, the rabbis don't come and no add a decree. That the, uh, when, you, when you've got a halacha, right? So the rabbis can come along and they can add a dimension to that halacha. They can be, be more stringent, right? <clears throat> they can decree something that we have to do 
around the, uh, around the original halacha. Okay. However, when the rabbis have already decreed something, so they can't come now and make another decree to go around it. Mm -hmm. That's considered to be, that you're being too, that's being too stringent. Right. Because Hanukkah itself is a decree, right, it was decreed by the sages, and it wasn't something which was given to us by the Torah itself, mm -hmm. therefore, they don't decree that outside of Israel, they need to keep an extra day. The good news is, because we're Jewish, it's permissible to eat as soon as the candles have been lit, right? And you, you don't have to wait, even though many people have the custom not to do work for the half an hour that the candles are alight for, but if the work's already been done before, and you're just sitting down to have a meal, that's 100% okay, you don't have to wait. Um, interestingly enough, if you know anything about the, the Talmud, right, the Babylonian Talmud, has a tractate for everything except for Hanukkah. It's quite fascinating. So, for yeah. example, there's a tractate that's dedicated for, to Purim called Masechta Megillah. There's a tractate that's dedicated to Pesach and a tractate that's dedicated to Sukkot and a tractate that's dedicated to Shabbat, right? And, and uh, you know, all, everything's got a tractate except for Hanukkah. There's no tractate, there's no Masechta Hanukkah. It comes, um, Shabbos, it? it comes inside of Shabbos, and it's all really rather roundabout, right? The way that it's learnt inside of Shabbos, it talks about something, a book, you know, a pit which is over 20 amot deep. Then it says from there that you can't see something, and then you've got to be careful about where you light your Hanukkah light. It appears in a couple of other places as well, but the, uh, the but it doesn't. It's it's interesting. It doesn't have its own separate tractate, which one would imagine it ought to have. The uh, Sam Sofer. The Chatam Sofer, one of the great, one of the great rabbis from a few generations ago, <clears throat> he writes that this is a form of a punishment. The Chashmonaim, uh, who originally they were the ones that went to war, right? So the the the, the Kohanim, the Maccabees, they were the ones that got up and they said, "We have to go and we have to fight." Um, the you know it's a. Uh, me, Kamoicho, Belim Hashem, Maccabees is like an acronym for we, we, we belong to God, right? We're not going to put up with this any longer. And they went off to war. However, the problem is <clears throat> that afterwards they took upon themselves a monarchy. Now, the problem is that the Kohanim, priests, cannot be kings. It's two completely separate strands of leadership. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons why it's supposed to be like that is to have checks and balances. And that's where, the, that's where the kings are supposed to come from, right? Which means the tribe of Judah is the kingly strain, and the tribe of, of Levi, and particularly the, the uh, children of Aaron, they're the Kohanic strain, right? And, and the two are not supposed to mix together because there really is supposed to be a form of, of you know, separation. I, I, please excuse, excuse the, uh, the phrase, but I guess separation of church and state which means that, uh, that the king takes care of the physical needs of the people and he can do whatever he wants, right, with regards to physical things, right? I can, I can, I can requisition whatever I want as king, right? Any, any kind of physical dimension, right? I can requisition whatever I want, which means that, you know, I need you, I need you now. We're going to go to war. I need you now. Here, I can take you into the army without getting permission from anybody. I can take your land without having to go and get permission from anybody. That's the function of the king. But the king is not allowed to start giving dictates about spiritual dimensions, right? Which means that there's an absolute okay. separation. And the whole idea is to keep some kind of a balance, right? Who was it who said, I, I, think, it, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's, they say that, I think Lord Tennyson who said that, you know, power corrupts and total power corrupts totally. Um, so the idea of having two forms of leadership one taking care of the physical dimensions and one taking care of the spiritual dimensions was a method of trying to keep things more or less balanced. Does it work? Right? Huh? Does it work? It, did, it works. It doesn't always work. Right. right? But it worked uh, pretty well for us? It did, it did work. I mean, it worked for, you know, for generations it worked. Yeah. Um, here, you're gonna, always going to run into problems. So, for example, what are the, what, what the Hashmonaim? They were all Kohanim. They were all priests. And yet they took upon themselves a monarchy after they fought back and managed to retake the temple and rededicate it, they took upon themselves a monarchy, and that was something, that was something that they had no right to do, <clears throat> and therefore, as a form of a punishment, again, it's a theory, a theory of the Chassam Sofer, right? 
that as a form of a punishment, there was no tractate that was dedicated solely to Hanukkah. Because the truth is, it, it all ended up, it didn't, it didn't end up well in the end. Which means the immediate aftermath was great, and for, I think, for two generations, everything was okay. <clears throat> but after that, it all just started spiraling out of control. <clears throat> there was a little bit of a civil war, two different, two, two different people who were, you know, fighting over the throne, and uh, each one went to a different, a different member of the Syrian, you know, not the Syrian, of the, of the Greek Empire, and uh, the Greeks came back, and that really was the end of... Um, the end of the of the Jewish rulership over the land of Israel. Um, okay, let's have a look and see. The most famous question of all that's asked about Hanukkah is, when do we get to eat the donuts? But there is a the second most famous question is, why do we keep eight days of Hanukkah? We should really only keep seven days, right? Because again, they found the pitcher of oil. The pitcher of oil was supposed to last for how long? For one day which means it kept alight for eight days. So really, the miracle was only seven days long. <clears throat> so it's actually, this is, a, this is a question which has garnered up a huge amount of interest. There's even a book, that, that, uh, a book called Nel Mea, which has got a hundred reasons why Hanukkah is eight days long and not seven days long. Wh whatever, there's, a, there's a, lot of, a lot of explanations over here. <clears throat> the, the, uh, simple, the simple shot, of course, is that they found the pitcher of oil. I mentioned yesterday, you know, they went into these enormous cavernous hangars where, which were chock-a-block full of pitchers of defiled oil, and they searched and they searched and they searched until they found this little pitcher, which means finding the pitcher itself was something which, uh, which you know, was a miracle in and of itself. Therefore, the first day of Hanukkah, according to this idea, commemorates finding the pitcher. The seven days of Hanukkah that come afterwards, they commemorate the idea of the light staying alight. That's one, one opinion. One, one, there's one, one, uh, one opinion which says like this, which I think, again, a very, a very simple opinion. The number eight represents everything which is lamala minateva, something which is beyond nature, right? Supernatural. <clears throat> and the Orach HaShulchan says that the very fact that the Jewish army, Jewish army, what was it, a, bu a bunch of, like I mentioned yesterday, a bunch of weedy yeshiva bochrim who went out to war against the mightiest army in the world and they won, the very fact that they won is an indication that this whole thing is miraculous and therefore commemorating for eight days is very apt because the number eight represents everything which is above nature. It's not a natural dimension. There is a, another, another dimension <clears throat> which is found in the Gemara. Uh, there's a very famous story. The daughter of Rabbi, somebody called Rabbi Hanina ben Dosa, his daughter came to tell him as Shabbos had already come in, she says, Daddy, I made the most terrible mistake. And instead of, instead of filling up the, you know, the, the, instead of filling up the Shabbos lights with oil, I put in by mistake vinegar. Right? And now it's already Shabbos and I've, I've lit them and vinegar is going to burn out. You know, it won't burn. And uh, it's a problem. And uh, Rabbi Hanina ben Daisa told his daughter, don't worry. He says, whoever tells the oil to light will tell the vinegar to light instead. Right? So do, you do the same for the vinegar. And that's what happened. That, that vinegar stayed alight. And she stayed alight until the, the, following, the following week. <clears throat> so another, another concept. Why are, we, why are we celebrating the first night of Hanukkah if they already found the oil? It was supposed to stay alight for one, for one day anyway. So the idea is because this, this, the whole concept of oil burning is something which HaKadosh Baruch Hu has brought into nature. But we should always understand that nature is something which belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. <clears throat> somebody, somebody once, I think it was a Meshach Chochmah, once wrote that there's nothing natural about nature. Which means that we have to, we have to recognize you know, the divinity of everything, including the fact that oil can light. Another opinion... We mentioned yesterday, they knew that they were going to need oil that was going to last for eight days. <clears throat> there are two reasons that are given why eight days. The first one we mentioned yesterday was because it took four days to reach where the, oil gro where the olive groves were. So it took them four days to get them, four days to get back. Right? So they knew that they were going to need oil for eight days. However, there's another opinion which says that all of the Kohanim, all of the priests were... <clears throat> 
all of the priests were impure because they'd been, they'd been to war. They'd come in contact with a dead body and that makes them spiritually impure. And it takes eight days to become spiritually pure after having touched a dead body. Right? So what does that mean? It means that they can light the first candle, they can light straight away when they dedicate the temple because if everybody's impure, then that's okay. But afterwards, they knew that it was going to take eight days until they would be able to light again the oil. So according to that opinion, says the Beis Yosef, what did they do? They separated the oil into eighths and every day they put in the eighth for that day. And the oil kept alight the whole time, even though there wasn't enough there to keep to, to stay alight for a whole day. Nevertheless, they put in the oil every day and it stayed alight the whole day. If that's the case, says the Beis Yosef, that means that the first day was as much a miracle as any other day because they're putting in not enough oil to be able to do that. Another reason that's given is that on the first day, I don't know which is right and which is wrong, right? I'm yeah. just telling you what people say. Another reason that is given is that on the, on the first night, they emptied out the entirety of the contents of the bottle into the oil, in, into, into the menorah, to, you know, at the beginning, to use it all up in order to fulfill the mitzvah in the best possible way. And the bottle then filled itself back up again. <clears throat> Some kind of a miraculous happening, and it refilled itself night after night after night until the eighth night. On the eighth night, it didn't fill itself up because they were going to have a replacement oil for the oil by then. You just mentioned a very, a very important thing over here. The menorah in the temple, if, if, you, walk, if you walk down to the kotel, yeah. right, when you walk down to the kotel, when you go down the stairs, right, on the left-hand side, just before you get to, the, to, you know, to that little, little plaza before you go down, there is the most extraordinary menorah over there. Have you seen it? Have you ever paid attention to it? No. Next time you go down there, take a look and see. <clears throat> On the left-hand side, it's a full-sized replica of the menorah that's supposed to have been in the temple. Um, and you'll see that it's only got seven branches. Have you been to the Knesset? No, I haven't. We're going uh, in three weeks. Oh, yeah? Okay, so when you go to the Knesset, <clears throat> take a look. Take a trip? Out. Yeah, it's like a day trip with the Jay and Jones, I think. Good. Wait, when you go, I'm sure they'll point it out to you, but, but take a good look outside the Knesset, made out of some black metal, is a seven-branch menorah, again, a replica of what was in the temple. The, uh, <clears throat> we're not going to get involved in the halacha, which says that you're not supposed to copy these things. Really? Yeah, we won't, we won't get involved in that. But the, uh, the, uh, the menorah that was in the temple had seven branches. <clears throat> And it's interesting, it, it talks about the seven branches of wisdom that come out of the Torah. The Torah itself is the middle branch and all the other ones come out on, on each side. There's, a, there's an interesting disagreement amongst the, uh, amongst the early authorities about what the menorah looked like. Now, you're, you're probably all familiar with the, you know, the pictures that you've seen outside of the Knesset and the one down by the... It's sort of, it's sort of round, got like rounded branches to it. The Rambam, Maimonides, was of the opinion that it wasn't like that at all. The Rambam was of the opinion that it was a central pole going down the middle, and then coming out at a straight angle were three branches. <clears throat> and it was a, a much more angular design. Now, I'll tell you something interesting, actually. <clears throat> they weren't allowed to like, draw that, pictures of it? That's engraving. You could draw, you could draw pictures of it. Uh, they're engravings as well. I mean, there's this famous picture on the, uh, you know, engraving on the Titus's arch, yeah. uh, which is a slightly problematic because the base of the menorah doesn't, on, on Titus's arch, the base of the menorah doesn't match up to anything. <clears throat> it's, not, it's, not, it's not right. <clears throat> the only thing it matches up to is, is um, Roman, you know, Roman bases of different, different candelabra they had in those days. There is a theory that the, uh, you know, the people that were doing the, the people that were doing the etchings on the, on the uh, arch, so they etched what the menorah looked like, but the bottom part, no one was really paying very much attention, so they just drew whatever would have been the norm at that time, which I guess is, you know, sounds to me as, as much of a reason as any other. That, so I was calling it the Rambam. The Rambam says that they were coming out at an angle. And the truth is that the Rambam's explanation is an explanation which fits in very neatly with the concept inside of the temple. Rav Hirsch says all of the utensils inside of the temple were angular. 
Right. All utensils. All of the utensils. So, for example, you've got the you've got the altar was angular, right? You've got the you've got the uh, the the Oran, the, the the holy ark was angular, like right? Instead of a circle. Instead of a circle, he says, "Why is that?" He explains Rav Hirsch because circles are natural, mm -hmm. and angular things are not. Mm -hmm. you, you have to make an angle, right? Okay. <clears throat> a circle is something here. Think, think of the, think of the earth, right? It's, it's a sphere. Um, think of think of my stomach, you know, it's, it's, it's natural, so it's round, right? <clears throat> if you don't have a round stomach, then something obviously there's something unnatural about you. Yeah. Um, the says Rav Hirsch that the utensils in the temple could not have been round because there was nothing natural about the temple. It was a, it was a supernatural place. According to the Rambam's depiction of the way that the menorah looked, it fits in very neatly with that idea, because it's all angular. You've got these branches coming out, right, at an angle, as opposed to the branches that appear, like, again, walking down to the Kotel or outside the, the uh, Knesset, where they're rounded, right? It's much more, it's a, a much softer look to it, uh, a much more, the truth is a much more appealing look to it, but it may not, it may not be accurate. In all events, the menorah that we light on Hanukkah has got eight lights, not seven lights. Right? The seven light, the seven seven branch menorah is only for the temple, and the eight branch menorah with the extra bit for the shamash, which we'll talk about in Mitzvah Shem at some point, that was uh, that was uh, for, that's made especially for Hanukkah.